pieces that we carry in our pocket. Some of them can contain up to 25 metals. And so our lives, our everyday lives, are materially connected to these huge machineries of extraction that wipe out mountains and destroy rivers, right? Also, in the face of, you know, like so much liberal boosterism that, you know, like argues uh, uh, that, you know, like we are in the midst of this fourth industrial revolution, especially people of the likes of, you know, like Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, right? In this, the, the usual liberal mindset of you know, like looking only at the sphere of exchange, they argue, you know, the fourth industrial revolution will bring so much a possibility for our world. It can also bring apocalyptic scenarios, but they also frame it in terms of a future scenario as a horizon of possibility. And because, and if we look, if we shift from the sphere of exchange towards the sphere of production, we see that those horizons are already being materialized and that advanced automation is already creating so many contradictory effects. Also, the idea of planetary mind <clears throat> as the fetishizing critique is also aimed to complement and you know, like en engage in a dialogue with many variants of, of the left uh, that uh, have tended to confuse the global movement, the global unfolding of value with its multiple phenomenal, historical, and census manifestations in the messy materialities of firms and states. So actually, according to Marx, one of, one of the major contributions in one of the manuscripts, in the manuscripts of 18, 1861 and 1863, he considered that the core contribution of his critique of political economy was to treat separately the essential movement of value from its fetishized expression in the categories of rent, of prices, of money, and commodities. And so we need to elaborate this analytical distinction for the reasons I have been explaining. Um, second, the planetary mind, we need to understand it as a pastoral idiom, because on the one hand, I mean, some iterations of the pastoral, yes, they like entail a romanticization of, you know, like the countryside or, you know, like this nostalgia for a lost past. But there are other more subversive iterations of the pastoral which entail interrogating the lives of those in the countryside who are being rapidly transformed by capitalist industrialization and see what social and political lessons can we learn from their lives, right? And we can see how the planetary mind in you know, like transcending the space of extraction so dramatically has created a degree of material interdependence that is very relevant. And for many of us, the people who live like in, in, in spaces of extraction or cities of extraction may be fundamentally different, but again, and we return to the concept of, uh, of um, the history of technology and of how, uh, you know, like the logics of extraction inform urbanization, you know, like the relationship is not only unilateral, you know, like as, for example, Lefebvre argued with the notion of the explosion of the city, the projection of urban infrastructures against the, into the countryside, there has also been, you know, like a relentless, you know, like a extrapolation of dynamics of extraction towards the city. Not only in the physical sense, fracking and some other forms of extraction, but uh, in the form of an, like, a, like, a, like a more advanced version of rentier capitalism. And many activists of gentrification, of, you know, like, again, like that, like a, a mobilized against construction companies, real estate companies, have begun to argue that you know like they, these companies operate like like mining companies they have argued that is you know like a form of like a urban extractivism and so for example we see you know like how and a recent article by the guardian argued that you know like humans themselves are being redefined as frackable units so we we need to interrogate what are these mechanisms that bring together our lives and try to you know like render into view all these relations of of co-determination and co-dependence so thank you very much Um, but so, 
clearly you use planetary mining in contrast to planetary urbanization. Um, or, or maybe I, maybe you see them as aligned mm -hmm. somewhat. But I guess one thing with planetary urbanization is that they really stress like this kind of complex of financialization of, of um, speculation. Like that's where you know most money is being made today is, is in speculation on real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder how you would fit that into the mining um, part of planetary mining. Um, just the, that huge, that like a lot of the expansion of capitalism today is really driven by the financial industry and speculation on real estate itself, which is not necessarily mining, but maybe could be a metaphor for it. Yeah, do I reply to this question now? or? Take a salutary like um, sort of what you're trying to work through in terms of this idea of the planetary mind. But in my own work, you know, I, I, I struggle with these questions of questions of sovereignty, right? In this relationship to sort of institutions like the new international economic order and sort of other questions that come up in the 60s and the 70s related to the sale of um, primary commodities to the first world as a kind of basis of both like third world solidarity, but also sort of forms of political sovereignty that emerge in the 20th century. And so, like you know, how like how are you sort of thinking through some of, of these of these claims that you that you brought up in terms of like I, I think you said in one in one point in your presentation like we are the politicians we think through uh, these problems, but there seems to be something also intractable right about this about the recurrence of the nation forming and systems online in order for us. In order for us to be sovereign, we have to engage in these practices, and <coughs> these are the very these are the very same practices that are undoing our ability to be sovereign, particularly in the present with practices like financialization. Bring your talk a bit about this. Okay. Thanks so much for these papers. I learned a lot from them. Um, What, what's the, like, the last point you made, like the, the, old, the final, final point, like that those dynamics are not like the creation of the relative surplus populations? That right, that, that I, I, you know, are the, is the, the kind of, um, you know, the internal logic of capital to expand, continue to expand a, a labor force? It doesn't seem, right, mm -hmm. that, that okay. I mean, with, you know, capitalist crisis since the 1970s, that that labor can't, can't be absorbed. <coughs> Should I answer first? 
first or? <coughs> okay, so I'll try to first, you know, like maybe like uh, put together, you know, like the question of finance, which is very interesting, and you know, like there's there's also a very interesting financial and monetary dynamic to the very configuration of the spaces of extraction, which I didn't cover. But I mean, book project has a chapter on that, but I didn't cover due to lack of time. But uh, you know, like the mining industry has become relentlessly uh, financialized in many ways. And after the, two th uh, after the 2008, there was a very interesting uh, <coughs> like movement of you know, like, uh, speculative investment from the, speculat from the mortgage and you know, like the housing system towards more, you know, like, uh, because you know, like the, 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 there was nothing else after the, the, after the bust. There was nothing else to extract, quote unquote, you know, like from the housing system. So financiers started to reorient their investment strategies towards other very tangible assets and land, uh, the mining industry and the agro-industrial supply chain became, you know, like a fundamental, like uh, sources of of receivers of this you know, speculative investment. So it's very interesting to think about the dichotomy of city non city and see how they are so intermingled that the same financiers that before 2008 were pumping money into the into the mortgage system are now you know like triggering or like uh, aiming at agriculture and mining and how this has triggered all these processes of you know like of, of primitive accumulation you know, like the so-called you know like new scramble for Africa is a result of this new you know like the reorientation of investment strategies right so so there is a you know, like close interlinked dynamic there and about the like I think the question of finance also connects very interestingly with the production of surplus populations because one of the reorientation of these investment strategies of, of, of financiers was like through the scheme of the microcredit, um, the relative surplus populations, like profiting, like the so-called poverty industry uh, that Suzanne Soderbergh like captures brilliantly in her book, Debt for States and the Poverty Industry. You know, like how relative surplus populations, despite, and, and this is interesting to go back to the original Marxian notion of, of the relative surplus population, that despite the fact that it's a byproduct of capital accumulation, Right, it it is internal to the process of accumulation because it is a demographic mechanism to discipline labor. So we see we cannot understand these many processes of, of proletarianization taking place without understanding the role that relative surplus populations play in the reduction of wages. For example, in the mining industry, you know, like all these displaced peasants go to live like in, in, in mining towns, and you know, like who is going to unionize in the mining industry if they know that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who can do the same job as, as themselves, right? So you know, like the relative surplus population is internal to the dynamics of accumulation. And so, but again, I mean, that's the contradiction of, of you know, like the concept of the, or, of the organic composition of capital, that you know, like it, it tends towards the replacement of living labor with machines. So yeah, oh, I think I extended too much and I don't. The other question was about automation, right? Your question on, on automation and, 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 and the political authority of the state. I mean, yeah, Stone is, you know, like, does not touch too much upon, you know, like, the question of nature and the environment, which is such a shame because, you know, like, his framework is so powerful and so relevant. And, but, I mean, but, 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 but I guess that there's a huge, you know, like, way forward for, you know, like, uh, bringing, you know, like, the ideas of alienated labor and of capital as subject mm -hmm. towards the making of environments, right? So, and that's, I think, and towards the, the, so the political authority of the state and sovereignty. I think it's very interesting also, like this strand of, of the subterranean, you know, like strand of Marxism, the so called, you know, like open Marxism, which Postone shares important elements, is that it's not that, you know, like we need to abandon the concept of the sovereignty or the political authority of the nation state. I mean, this, it, it continues to exist, and at some points it has become exacerbated. We see a more interventionist state, but, you know, like this is a mode, a fetishized form of appearance, like a sensuous manifestation of a deeper underlying concept. So we need to, you know, like, dissect between these two. And of course, you know, like the, the you know, anti-capitalist thought and practice needs to engage with the theory of the state, you know, like, but, but also, you know, like, taking in mind, I don't know, so, I mean, it's a complex dichotomy and how to navigate that, but, you know, like, uh, it is, like, for example, one of these authors puts it, the international movement of socialism entails, uh, you know, like, Challenging the fragmentation of economic struggles, political struggles, uh, you know, like struggles in schools for education, and transforming everything into total class struggle, right? And, and bear this in mind. And you know, like the idea of you know, like inside this, one of the mottos was 
instead inside the state apparatus against the state form. So like, I don't know if that. Yeah, well, maybe, I, yeah, I think your point is right on, on how to link um, this, um, what you observe in, in how we, the <coughs> these last frontiers are not producing or going towards a, uh, proletarization has to be linked to financialization. I think, if, mm -hmm. well, in Bolivia and Peru and countryside, that's what you see with the microfinance that mm -hmm. um, there's, I mean, these, come on, if I look at the mining frontiers also in Peru, Bolivia coming in, it's not that they produce kind of new working class, they're looking through financialization more, yeah, producing new consumers and, and changing, I mean, communities are changing and are, um, uh, are changing in the context of, of that boom, but not into some <coughs> proletarianized uh, uh, form of, of relations, but more just being, people being exposed in a terrain that is completely contaminated and it's just, it's, it's not like, I mean, you can't read it in terms of, of a proletarianization, of a, pri a primitive accumulation that is kind of producing something new, but more just leaving devastated areas that are searching ways. And I don't know, you see a lot of things also coming like, like ecotourism, which is in many ways often more kind of disaster tourism, like looking how communities are surviving in the middle of, of, of nothing or tourism. extinction. So that links up to your <laughs> your presentation, but yeah. I, I don't think I have much to add. You guys, I think, really, you know, you got that down. <laughs> I mean, if we were talking more about the ecological idea with primitive accumulation, I do think there is no question that we see the kind of uh, resurgence and kind of intensification in the 1970s, right, as we start reaching the kind of planetary boundaries of uh, resource extraction. So I think that those two things are intimately linked to one another. But I won't guy that, that, yeah, I think you guys really, you know, <laughs> answered that pretty well. So. <laughs> about the relationship between this uh, kind of NUCA program with the, with the population, right? So my impression is that um, uh, nuclear energy served as a, um, as a way, right, of controlling population in terms of housing and uh, securitization of the, of the, of the population, uh, discipline of the families, so I don't know if you can more about that? Uh, yeah, I, well, if you're referring to, uh, I would say if we want to talk about that aspect and like go back to the 1950s, I'd actually say much more actually nuclear weapons, which are the disciplining mechanism. You can look at the logic of the rise of the interstate highway system, suburbanization, uh, all of these kind of processes you see going on in America, I believe that's what you're referring to, is kind of done under the umbrella of like uh, of this kind of nuclear uh, weapon kind of saber rattling, right? But I think that in a lot of ways at the same time, there's kind of, you could almost say the nuclear weapons are almost super structural to what is going on underneath and the real logic of the economy is being driven by oil, really. That's really what's happening. And if you look at the foreign policy of uh, the United States in that time period, we can talk a lot about primitive accumulation of oil resources around the world from the 1950s through 1970s, right? Uh, but so nuclear weapons, I kind of actually see more as something that kind of covers over what's going on, but it's a disciplining process at the level of developing a kind of petroculture. So there's a kind of intimate link you see between these two, but at the same time, they're very antagonistic to one another, right? In the 1950s and 60s, nuclear energy was supposed to replace fossil fuels. There's going to be power that's too cheap to meter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, obviously the problem was a huge sunken costs, uh, the necessity of the state to really bankroll all of it. That was a problem with nuclear fracking. You know, in the first test, they got about $50,000 worth of uh, natural gas to the price of millions of dollars, you know, making these nuclear. So, but that doesn't matter, right? Cause that's all being, you know, the socialized costs privatize the game, right? So I don't know if that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Um, what with population more, I wasn't sure what you're talking about with population, like the rise of population or certain kind of segmenting of populations designated by like 
white suburbans, logically right, national sacrifice zones, and Native American roads, more like that, you mean? Yes, yeah, so definitely, I think that's a very important point uh, in that, and we see that again, I mean, you know, citing a nuclear reactor or a nuclear fracking site is typically uh, in areas where either, you know, uh, people of color or, uh, you know, impoverished communities live, basically. Um, and indigenous reservations in our country are by far, uh, you know, through uh, the history of uh, the United States, the place where that is most intensified uh, through to this day. So, yeah, I think at the same time, we can actually look in the same way as the relationship between, uh, you know, the, as you were talking about, Martin, in the country and the city, we see that kind of same division of the kind of uh, the growth of this kind of suburbanized great acceleration state and that of very specific areas of kind of almost death zones of intensified uh, extractivism. Maybe that's more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, one last question. Uh, yes, um, thanks for the amazing presentations. Um, I was wondering, Martin, and, uh, about kind of the, you mentioned uh, the, the way in which this very infrastructure creates uh, the conditions for a new kind 